In 1960, Arthur Lee Burns of the National Australian University wrote an article for History and Theory entitled International Theory and Historical Explanation. In it, he argued that the historian of international affairs deals with subsystem dominant relations, where behavior of a single subsystem, a nation, may significantly affect that of the system as a whole. For such a system, explanations of unplanned gross events which utilize alleged theoretical laws are gratuitous. When a detailed reconstruction of the roles played by individual agents is sought, he argued, the deductive model of Popper and Himpel itself provides only an explanation sketch. A general theory of international affairs, dealing exhaustively with every possible type of systematic relationship between sovereign nations, would nevertheless be valuable in establishing an a priori plausibility of certain events. Here to speak with me about Burns and the role of theory in historical explanation is Dr. Bob Nicholson. Dr. Nicholson is a reader in history at Edgehill University, where he specializes in 19th century popular culture. His research focuses on Victorian newspapers and magazines to investigate popular humor, sport, gender, entertainment, and transatlantic relations. He is an exponent for and a trailblazer in digital humanities, particularly DH pedagogy. He has also published work on the use, construction, and creative remixing of online archives. He is perhaps best known outside of academia for the Old Joke Archive and the Victorian Humor Twitter feed, which I have found is the best place to find 19th century dad jokes. Thank you very much for joining me today, Bob. Thank you very much for having me. I've, I've been looking forward to this. Wonderful. So let us begin with a slightly more grounded question. As a historian of Victorian culture and particularly Victorian media, how has theory as opposed to methodology or sort of philosophy of history really impacted your research? And do you find it to be something that is at the forefront of your mind or something that is implicitly part of your research into media? Thanks. Yeah, this, this is a tricky one. I think if you'd asked me a few years ago, I'd have probably been quite sort of confident that I don't really use theory, that theory is not a part of my practice. It's not a thing that I've been particularly interested in. I was even quite like, hostile to it when I was an undergrad. I, I thought it was just a way of saying obvious things in a more complicated way. Um, and so I was quite resistant to it. And yet I think in, in recent years, and in fact, even just as I was thinking before we had this chat, I probably, in fact, I definitely do use theory sometimes in ways without even really realizing it and sometimes in ways that are, you know, are slightly more, more open. So actually I started jotting down all the kind of different theoretical concepts and ideas that I've sort of used at some point in my research. And actually, yeah, there, there are quite a few now that I realize I've been drawing on. I think if people were to read my work, they wouldn't see it as being a particularly prominent part of it. You wouldn't look and say, oh, this guy's really into his theory. I do try, I, my preference is to use it with quite a light touch. Sometimes I, I just think with the theory and then write without it, but it's definitely there in my work. And I think there are, I found it useful, I think, if I'm completely honest. In the end, I'm, I'm sort of, my younger self would be surprised to hear me admit this, but I think in the end, I have found instances where either it helped me to understand a historical problem or it gave me the kind of, I don't know, the language to explain it in a more convincing way. So in the end, yeah, there, there, have, been, there have been actually quite a few within that kind of broader cultural studies that I do that have allowed me to do things I probably couldn't have done just by thinking in methodological terms. And do you think that that's something that you notice when you read or does it feel quite implicit in other scholars and in media history that that theory is really an important part of our work? There's a lot. I think a lot of my work, um, so one, one of the main fields I work in, you know, is this sort of Victorian periodicals and, and newspapers as my sort of main source. And there's a load of people from English literature in that field who I think are much more open about their theory. They tend to talk in theoretical terms much more um, commonly and, and certainly at conferences. And so I think, you know, that I'm 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 probably aware that my work is less theorized than than a lot of people in my field, or at least they wear their theory more openly than perhaps I do. But I think, yeah, it's it's a very, very common thing. And there, there are certainly some theoretical concepts in, in media studies in particular that, that come up again and again and again, right? There are, you know, whether we talk in terms of the sort of the public sphere and the way that print sort of shapes people's relationships, whether we think about, you know, imagined communities, you know, readers being bound together in these, these groups who might never meet, 
but are nevertheless part of of this emerging community that Benedict um, Anderson talks about. So th th yeah, there are plenty of these these kind of theories bouncing around in the field. I think um, that. I sort of I just draw upon them when I find them useful. To be completely honest, I'm 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 and and, and sort of drop them when I don't. That's been very much my my philosophy on this. That theory I'm only interested in it when it's useful, when it right. when it allows me to do something. I I think there are some scholars. Maybe I'm being unfair here. I think there are some people who really like fetishize theory, who just want to work on it for its own sake and just love kind of unpicking it. And that's fine. But for me. It's really, it's a really utilitarian approach. If it allows me to say something I couldn't say without it, or to understand something in a powerful new way, I'll use it. But I'm perfectly happy to write something that has no theory in it, if that's the best way to do it. So I'm, right. I just sort of pick it up and drop it whenever, whenever I want. I think what you're saying there really resonates with a lot of people that I speak to when I talk about theory, is this idea that theory is a good thing, theory is useful, but it's not necessarily the main focus of a historian's work. And that really resonated with me, especially when you were talking about sort of picking it up when it helps you say something in particular. So it's a, a tool in your toolbox, but it's not something that you're trying to make the forefront of your work. So I think a lot of historians are perceived as, I'm gonna put this the nicest possible way, incorrigible antiquarians. <laughs> that we like to we like to go and we like to get lots of data and we like to collect it and put it in a big pile, but we're not necessarily sure what to do with it once we have it. And in other disciplines, the whole point of collecting data is to create these theories and create these sort of models for existence. And historians, in my experience, don't really perceive their work in that way. They don't think of it as being just um, the first step in creating a theoretical model. It has value in and of itself. So I wonder if you could maybe speak to that for a minute. What do you sort of think of the historian's role in either the humanities or the social sciences, but that sort of idea of what is the purpose of historical research, the way it's actually done? Hmm. This, is, this, is, this is tricky, I suppose. I mean, look, at, at a really basic level, I feel like my job is just to figure out just to understand the past, right? I mean, and that really is all that I want to do. I suppose there are, I see, yeah, I suppose there are two parts to, to, when I sort of boil it down, two parts to what, what we do, or certainly how I work. The first is a kind of internal thing. I want to understand something from the past. I want to figure out, okay, how did this happen? Why did it happen? What does this tell us? And the second thing I want to do is figure out a way to communicate that to someone. And that, but that could be in any number of ways, right? It could be in a really data-driven scientific way of, of sort of establishing patterns it could be in a narrative way in truth actually I think you know my my personal preference for history the way I love working is finding curious things in the past and then telling talking about them in an entertaining way which in many respects is like the, the least scientific approach to, to history imaginable right but yet there are moments as well where I think we really benefit from those those slightly tighter methodologies and those perhaps you know more scientific approaches that might allow us to do things that we can't do in that slightly more novelistic or journalistic way. And so I think, yeah, again, it, it comes back to that point of picking things when, I, when they're useful to me. I think, yeah, that, that I've never really felt that I'm establishing a kind of theoretical model for understanding things that I could then, that somebody else might then apply. Although, yeah, again, I guess there are occasions where I've tried to do that. This is the thing where I realize I've been doing it accidentally again, isn't it? You know, like, like I haven't really been thinking about it. So actually, I'll give you an example about this. It's something I've been thinking about recently, because actually this is something we, we're both involved in. So, we're, you know, we're in this sort of this research network on cosmopolitanism in in the 90s, in sort of the fin de siècle in Scotland. Yes. And it was really nice to be invited to this. And, you know, and I'm really curious about it. But I don't, I didn't really know anything about cosmopolitanism before I said I would join it. Um, or I don't work on Scotland. So I was kind of like wondering, like, what am I going to say when I come to do the my talk for this? And they wanted me to talk about digital archives. And I've been sort of thinking, how do I do this in a way that might be relevant to that group? And I went to the first meeting online when people were sort of theorizing what is cosmopolitanism as a kind of thing, as a, as a concept, and how is it applied in different places? And then I started thinking, like, what if we applied that idea to archives our archives cosmopolitan and what might happen if we made them more cosmopolitan in other words where do we take that theoretical model that people apply to cities and then apply them somewhere else and i started actually i've started sort of really getting loads of ideas out of it now as a sort of new way of thinking about archives 
so in that sense, I think, you know, okay, I have probably taken some kind of theoretical model there and then thought, okay, how can we apply that concept in places where it's unfamiliar? And in that sense, I guess maybe it is sort of a slightly new theoretical way of doing things, but but yeah, not not in quite the kind of robust sort of theoretical model that Burns is talking about or the really predictive stuff that he's talking about. It's more, again, it's a tool for thinking. As of, sometimes it's a metaphor for thinking about something. And that's that tends to be how I work, I think. I think you've expressed that in a really lovely way, the idea of a tool for thinking. And when I first began my historical training, I guess if, if we can call it that way, there was a, a lecturer in, in Indiana in Bloomington who said that the whole point of training future historians was habits of the mind and, and ways of thinking. And that really sort of summed up for me the humanity side of history. It wasn't so much about creating a, a perfect teachable set of, of reference points that if this happens, you should do this, but that the world is really complicated and the more different perspectives or the more different ways you can look at a problem, the more likely you're not to get destroyed by something bad happening to you, that you can kind of, you can kind of cope with the, the world and, and even succeed in it. So the, the ways of thinking, I think, is a lovely way of putting it. Um, so let's dive Let's dive into Burns then. And sure. Burns's article for me is, I won't say it's its scattered because it's very well thought through, but it's definitely like three articles kind of combined together. He's trying to do three very, very different things. So I'll try to just focus in on a couple of them. Sure. Burns makes the case that he's there's a difference between a deterministic theory, the kind of theory you would have in physics where um, you hit a ball and it'll roll a certain distance given friction or momentum. It's very deterministic. You know exactly what's going to happen. And non-deterministic theories, which is sort of this is likely to happen given this general set of, of circumstances, but not guaranteed. It's just the, the most likely outcome. And he wonders if a historian, a good historian, really needs those kind of non-deterministic theories when he's doing his historical explanation. And I kind of want to know your thoughts about this. Do you feel that historical explanation can inform theory? Do you think that theory informs historical explanation? You, you talk about how it's a toolkit, but I think in a, in a much more narrow sense I'm asking here, does it help you fill in gaps or are you trying to fix problems in the theory? Look for exceptions, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I, I, I definitely feel, you know, like that, that those non-probabilistic theories. I think that that's a much more plausible way to work. I think Burns talks. I think one of the phrases he uses is the the irreducible uncertainty of human behavior. And I think, like, I absolutely buy into that. I, I think I'm deeply skeptical of anything that says put enough data into this and we can absolutely predict exactly what will happen. I don't, think, I don't even now, you know in the age of sort of big data now where you know Google and various people have collected every bit of data point about us to figure out what we want to buy on Amazon or something. I think that the best they can just predict, right? You know, and, and sometimes they get scarily close, but it's never going to be that absolute certainty. So I'm skeptical of, of, of such such simple theories. So I think yeah, and the question then is, can we use those those sort of the slightly looser things of what might happen. And yeah, I, I, th I think I think we can. And you're right, I think the phrase you used that I really like was it's filling gaps. You know, things that we actually can't derive from a straightforward analysis of evidence. And so I'll give you an example of this. So at the moment I've been working on um, on a lot on the history of comedy and laughter in the 19th century. And this is a thing, you know, joking and laughter is a thing that leaves really scattered traces and and, and only part of the act. So what what I found loads of, millions of, are printed jokes in 19th century newspapers. So I can say with reasonable confidence, these are the kind of jokes people were telling in print, at least. Maybe not what they were telling in private, but in print. What I have absolutely no idea about is why or how people responded or what kind of work they performed. Because nobody says, haha, that was a great laugh. I must now go to my diary and record in meticulous detail why I found this funny and the kind of underlying social and political work it was performing. That just doesn't, well, occasionally you will get somebody write like a Victorian writing a, like a 50 page essay on the nature of humor where they think about this stuff. But generally speaking, people don't. 
So that's where potentially theory can come in, right? So we might take someone like, I don't know, Freud or somebody who's talking about jokes as an expression of the unconscious or saying things that we wouldn't say in polite society. That suddenly becomes a really powerful sort of connecting force where I can say, okay, if this theory holds true, and, and this is debatable, right? Whether jokes are expressions of the unconscious, we could sort of think about that. But if it's true, then potentially jokes are telling us things that we might not find in more serious texts, that they're revealing something about, you know, something within Victorians, something that they don't necessarily express publicly or in, you know, normal newspaper articles. That suddenly makes those texts really powerful. You know, that I now have millions of these things that are potentially expressing thoughts that I wouldn't find elsewhere, or at least that they're reinforcing my belief that maybe the Victorians held these these beliefs about race, about gender, about class, about certain professions. So in that case, theory potentially is a way to take what might seem like a really inconsequential text, a joke, something as throwaway as a one-liner or a pun, and by sort of passing it through you know, Freud, but many, you know, there are loads of other ways to interpret jokes. That suddenly actually, it doesn't just sort of fill a gap, but it really amplifies the source and it, and it reveals its significance. So whether the theory holds true, I think is up for debate, but its usefulness is kind of there. And you're right, it's filling that gap. It's getting into the mind of the Victorian who never said, this is why I found this funny. So there's, there's two things there I want to touch on. The first one is you, you point to Freud, who is obviously writing at sort of the, the end of the Victorian or, or, you know, the early Edwardian period, or I don't know if it's right to talk about Freud in Edwardian terms, but um, <laughs> it's, it's not that far from the period you're discussing, but I think what you're implying with what you're saying there is that there are some theories that may be universally applicable to human beings. And I think that gives an idea that if I were looking at jokes from the 18th century, someone very, very far removed from Freud or from, you know, uh, ancient Greece, someone thousands of years removed from Freud, I would still probably expect the theory to be equally applicable. So if it's if it's true in one situation, and that's, like you said, debatable, but if it is true, then it would be true in lots of different places. And that's sort of an implicit belief that human beings, even if we have different cultures, even if we have different environments, there's something universal about us that we can use over and over again. Do you kind of feel like that's, that's true? Do you utilize that idea when you look at your historical sources and your historical figures? I'm sort of, I think I have a healthy skepticism about it in, in the sense that laughter is an interesting thing because in, in some respects it it sort of is, is treated as a, as a sort of an involuntary sort of biological thing, you know, something that we can't control. I have a feeling that that's not true. I'm pretty sure that it, it is culturally specific. I think probably it does change that people, laughter means different things at different times and therefore, yeah, we probably should be quite cautious about how far we can apply that theory to different cultures, to different time periods. I think, again, I, I would be looking for the kind of contextual evidence that helps to to sort of ground that theory in real circumstances. So I, I'm skeptical of the kind of the universal approach to things. But again, that, that that's only if I was using it as an absolutely cast iron way of saying this absolutely happened. If it's a useful tool of thinking about it, of saying, OK, this is one way in which you might explain this. Here's a kind of and it may be convincing, it may be not, it may be partial, it may be not. That's that's as far as I'd want to go with that. I, I'm, I'm skeptical of theory that, basically, I don't like any theory that claims to prove something. You know, <laughs> I, I like it as a way of theories that suggest things. Or that you just made every scientist watching this cringe. So. Yeah, I know, right. Well, because, okay, so in, in a scientific context, absolutely, fine. You know, when there are theories that, that, that you can apply universally, that say, yeah, if we do X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C will happen, Fine. I just don't think humans are like that. I don't think history is like that. At best, we're going to get a this is one possible interpretation. And I would always then want the kind of the evidence that helps to corroborate that. I would, I would want something that says, OK, here's my theory. Here's the, you know, the kind of even if it's just partial evidence, even if it's just two or three people saying, OK, yeah, that this this is sort of how this is playing out on a grand scale. I would want that. I wouldn't want theory on its own. And I think for, for me, like in you know, in, in the digital humanities at the moment, there are all these attempts to try and to try and do this, right? Using big data to try and draw concrete conclusions about the past that you can plot on a graph. And for me, at the most, it's it they're asking questions, they're raising things, saying, "Go and look at that more closely." 
I would never want the theory on its own. I wouldn't want to stake my reputation or my interpretation just on the theory. It's got to have some evidence, right? Absolutely. And that's that was sort of the other half of what I was going to ask you is this idea that if we're not using theories as a cast iron way of, of definitely filling in the gaps of replacing lost data somehow. Do you think that there is something in most historians? I don't want to say contrarism, but this idea that if somebody comes in and says a, a generalization or a blanket statement or a rule for the way that human beings react, that something in historians want to say, well, actually, and, and prove all the exceptions to the theory instead. Do you think there's something in the historical profession that likes exceptions to the rule? Maybe. There's definitely something in me that likes that. I mean, I, I can only speak for myself on this. I think, yeah, I think it's one of the things we're taught, isn't it? And I, I find myself saying this to my students when they talk about the Victorians thought this or the Victorians did that. And I'm like, well, you know, you're talking about millions of people over many decades from a whole range of races, classes, genders, professions. How can you ever say what the Victorians thought? Because there are always going to be variations within that. And so we teach students, or at least I do, to, to speak in much more cagey language like, you know, many, you know, middle class Victorians tended to argue, middle class Victorians such as X, Y and Z tended to argue that, you know, that, that that's as far as I would want to go. Of course, having said that, we have to make some generalizations because we can't talk about the past as if, you know, if, if we just if we go from the point of view that every individual thinks differently, that acts in a completely individual way, we can never really say anything beyond that individual. So we have to find those patterns. But again, I, I would always want them to be framed not as universal truths, but as generally observable patterns. I think, you know, there are, right? There are things that are happening at a broader scale than the individual. There are shared beliefs, shared practices, and we can chart their history. But yeah, I'm, I would always be wary of the exception because I think it's always out there. And yeah, I think, I think it's sort of the job of a historian is to be aware of those nuances. Right. And Nuance is a lovely word. It's it's one of those things that I think it's miss, not overused. It's probably underused actually. There's not a lot of nuance in the world anymore. But it's it's one of those things that people don't necessarily understand. Nuance isn't just being cagey. I I think it's about understanding the extent to which general rules apply and the extent to which. There are hidden variables or there are um, interacting variables, things that are are difficult to, you know, we could have a theory that's very, very accurate, but then it would only apply to three people. And um, it's it's making that balance. Yeah, I agree. You, you, you mentioned individuals there, and I think that falls on quite nicely to, to what Burns was talking about. He, I found this really lovely. He, he talks about two different types of historians. And I had come to a similar conclusion a couple of years ago about different types of historians, but I used entirely different examples than he did. So I, I wonder where you kind of sit on this. He separates historians into individualistic historians, people who want to understand how an individual person thinks, the individual actions, their individual intentions. And if you add them all up together, sort of like the raindrops in a rain cloud, you'll eventually figure out what the, the grand movement is. And then the other type of his, and this is what I would sort of say is sort of um, Thomas Carlyle um, idea of history, where individuals have their own agency, their own ideas, um, maybe even a little Hegelian. But then you have what he refers to as the Tolstoyan version of historians, which I thought was lovely. And it's this idea that there is a, a momentum in history on its own. And it kind of drags us mere mortals along with it. And I think he means this more metaphorically than literally when we when we write about history. We either talk about individual agency or we talk about wider movements kind of sweeping people up. When you talk about the media, because it's so difficult to get all of those diary entries, do you find yourself talking about the the great momentum and waves of, of thought and history? Or do you find yourself trying to recreate the individual intentions and actions of, of men and women? I think the ideal is to try and do both, isn't it? I think if you can, because I just don't think, I don't necessarily see them as opposing things, even though even though they're kind of two extremes of, of ways of writing. 
I think but both are happening simultaneously in, in reality, right? And that there are broad thing, you know, forces, whether they're technological, political, economic, that affect all of what we do. You know, that um, you know, we're recording this in the middle of a pandemic, right? You know, this is not necessarily the work of any individual. I mean, we could trace it back down to a you know, thousand different individual responses or, or actions, but nevertheless, there is this broader context that is that is shaping everything we're doing. But within that, I think individual people have agency. And so, I mean, I've, I've all, you know, that's something I've always felt very strongly about. I've never bought into the idea that people are just sheep being kind of herded along by the media. I think I've always felt in, in, in terms of newspapers that individual readers all have agency. They all express that and, you know, they all have power. And so talking about them as a single group, all thinking the same way, I've never felt comfortable with. Though, of course, in the absence of evidence, sometimes we have to kind of draw some of those generalizations again with new ones. So, yeah, I think generally speaking, I would I would always try and get down to that more individualistic view of things, that more getting down to the specifics of something. But having said that, you know, the, the PhD I did was basically on like transatlantic relations. So it's basically how millions of people in two countries interact with one another. So in a sense, like, I, you know, I am interested in those broad things. I don't just want to know. I'm, I don't tend to do micro history. Mm. I do tend to do kind of broader cultural studies that investigating concepts or phenomenon that thousands or millions of people might be engaging with or having it shape their lives. But I'm still kind of, I, I would always want that individual evidence if I can get it, right? You know, you always want to try and get down to that. So I would say that, yeah, ideally I try and do both. I'm quite skeptical of of histories that attempt to sort of do like the entire history of the world in 400 pages or something like that. I just, I'm just not really that interested in that kind of, that broad sweep stuff. Um, so that's if that's the kind of the Tolstoyan view, then yeah, I'm, I'm probably not into that. But at the same time, I think contextualizing the work of individuals in that kind of wider, along those wider forces that are shaping what they're doing, I think that's fine, right? And I think that's that's inevitable. But I don't think those wider forces are determining precisely what those people will do. It's like creating a window in which they might make choices. Is right. how I would how I think about it. They can't resist those underlying forces but they can kind of shape how they respond within them. A very Taoist way of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's an answer. Maybe it's just a cop out, but it, it's sort of like, I, I just, I, I, yeah, again, I just, I would, I would just go with whatever kind of evidence I have will shape the, the nature of the claim I can make about it. I think for, for me, when I was reading, when he was talking about Tolstoy, it wasn't so much, well, perhaps with Tolstoy, the idea that, you know, there was some supernatural or, or, transcendent force pushing mankind in a certain direction but that it was because it's so complicated because it is millions of people in, in your case millions of people in two different nations you have to sort of the only way you can explain it in an intelligible way is to sort of talk about the net um, effect of all of these millions and millions of individual reactions so if you know to make it way too simple you know if, if 10 million people we're all working towards one goal and 10 million and two people were all working towards the other goal, the net would be a slight movement in that direction with the two people mm -hmm. in excess. But there is this sense that, and this is the feeling I really get from sociology when I try to use sociological models in my work, is this idea that we acknowledge that individual peoples have an agency, but if we're going to get anything useful out of it, we do have to kind of look at the net effect mm -hmm. of everything. And I think that's something that I, as a historian, really have difficulty doing. I really, I don't like to move too far away from the individual and the understandable nature of a, of a single person. Um, the mob mentality has always kind of frightened me, and I don't want to indulge in it too much in my, my historical work. And maybe that's just a, a personal preference. But I think, I think that's why a lot of historians think they don't use theory or think that theory isn't part of them because they associate theory with that idea of turning human beings into, into numbers. There's a, a fantastic book by Alan Vogue that I use sometimes called Cleo and the Bitch Goddess. And it's, it's about, you know, how afraid historians are of quantification. And I think cultural historians, especially, and, and maybe yeah. you could speak to this, um, are concerned about the the negative effects of trying to quantify cultural trends. So 
is there is there a sense that theory is dangerous or or theory could have not just incorrect answers but could actually be very um have an actual negative effect on the people that history is supposed to be helping do you do you have any concerns about quantification like that i never really thought about it in those terms i definitely i i'm I have a sort of, I'm, I'm in two minds about quantification and I was really enthusiastic about it, particularly in the early sort of stages of digitization and thinking about what new quantitative things can we do now that we have access to sources this way. And I do still feel really, really sort of optimistic and enthusiastic about that because I think it's in some respects, it's the only way to deal with scale. It, it's sort of like, as you were saying, right, you know, when if you look at a, at a newspaper running over, you know, an entire century, how many, you know, thousands or millions of articles do we have there you know way more than i can ever read way more than i could ever cite in an argument and so yeah i'm i'm, I'm always looking for ways that i can that i can sort of demonstrate that a the small examples i'm using are representative of a wider phenomenon and quantification is a really useful way of doing that i think it can potentially reveal patterns i think that the challenge comes in figuring out what can we and can't we measure you know like what, what is quantifiable and what kind of arguments can we make with it and and I think done right, we can make we can make um, arguments about, say, how the content of a newspaper changes over time, how often a certain phrase or person or thing is mentioned. And that's useful, right, to, to know if a certain thing enters the zeitgeist or or disappears or how it circulates. That absolutely, I think, quantifying that with some healthy skepticism about what are we actually quantifying is fine. But then, yeah, when you get the slightly or the more complex things where people are trying to quantify happiness or measuring sentiment automatically in a very quantifiable way, I think that's interesting. I really like that research in the sense that I think they're doing some really cool stuff. But I think often it leads to quite unconvincing arguments for me. And so that quantification, I think, I think it is potentially exciting, but it it's it, it's something that think can, people can do wrong really they can sort of run away with a particular theory that they think is going to universe yeah let, let's take the happiness one for example right you know so there was this so you, you remember this this sort of article published by um computer scientists recently saying that we were happiest in the 1880s based on measuring millions of pages of newspapers and books and using i, I forget the details here some kind of metric that says happiness is expressed with this particular type of language and therefore, if we see those words, those phrases being used more in a certain time, then we can conclude that the people are more happy. And that's kind of interesting, right? Wouldn't it be wouldn't it be nice to know when we were happiest? I think that's kind of a curious thing. First things first, I don't even really know what happiness is in general, right? That, that's just not a thing that I could ever pin down. But even if we could, there are then those questions of like who are newspapers representing? You know, are we measuring changes in the press? Are we measuring changes in wider culture? There are just so many issues there for me with that methodology if you want it to provide a simple answer and so that th those are the issues i have with quantification i think it can be really powerful but i think it often gets used actually it's frustrating i suppose that the most technologically advanced research in this is not being done by historians and they often bring historians in afterwards to try and explain their findings when they've been asking the wrong questions see now that's that's a really good point it's about the questions that are being asked as opposed to the interpretation of the data. I think a lot of people in and outside of, of history sometimes, I don't know if they want to feel it, but they certainly get the, the temptation to that the data speaks for itself and that it doesn't require that level of interpretation. And I think this is particularly important now because there's a lot of rhetoric about interpretation and all interpretation is biased or prejudice or you know we want to just have the truth the facts the the not the fake news and it's difficult for me because as somebody who looks at misinformation and mistakes just honest mistakes in in reportage in the 18th and early 19th century the whole idea of fake news is is very difficult for me to to kind of wrap my head around the difference between a lie and a mistake so all of these these sorts of things are they require historical empathy or historical understanding and that starts with the question as opposed to just the interpretation of the data afterwards and i think that's a really good point that you're making i think yeah so an example of i think that i would always say that you can almost apply the same rules as if you're analyzing one source if you're as if you're analyzing a million of them 
right? The same methodological rigor has to go in there. You still have to be thinking, what is this source representing? How is it produced? What, what sort of aspect of the past is it capturing? And it's, it's impossible to do that on an individual level for 20 million newspaper articles. But you still have to sort of think in those sort of broader principles that we would apply, or a more, more conventional histori you know, historical analysis would apply just that one close reading. Right. You've still got to have that same skepticism, that same rigor, that same sense of what are these sources telling me? What questions can I ask them? What, what won't they tell me in order to make sense of the data? And I think, yeah, one of the mistakes that tends to get made, I think, is that, yeah, people treat this data as if it's neutral or pure, or it's just this enormous sort of bucket of words from which we can divine truth. And, you know, I, I just don't think that that holds water. You wouldn't do that with one article. So why do it with 10 million? The, the idea of happiness is always a really fun one with um, sentiment analysis, because obviously, or not obviously, but um, because we know that the word, the word itself, happiness, has a very different meaning over the past two or three hundred years. It, it means culturally different things, but just in terms of how it would have appeared in the dictionary, it means different mm -hmm. things. And I think culturonomics or our various quantifications and sentiment analysis does not take into account that words don't have fixed meanings mm -hmm. and yeah. fixed connotations. When I was doing sentiment analysis on the Battle of the Alamo with my students, we took you know, several hundred articles about the, the siege of the Alamo and put them into sentiment analysis. And by and large, it came back with pretty expected results. People were sad. There was lots of talk about death. But there was a, a little cluster of my students who received um, very happy articles, articles that were very excited, full of joy. And I said, oh, are they reprints from Mexican newspapers? Like, why, why are they so happy? And the students were like, no, they're horrible articles. They're, you know, they're all about death and destruction. And what we realized is the article had used the phrase, the military party mm. over and over again. And the cinema analysis had just seen the word party and decided it was a very, very happy article. And again, that's something that never would have accidentally happened from a close reading. But if you're processing 20 million articles and you just take that result that actually people in Louisiana were just very happy about the siege of the Alamo for no reason. It, it can really make a dangerous assumption about who these people are, were and, and what they were thinking. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really lovely example of that. And you, you're right that it's one of the things that historians, the literary scholars, linguists all would sort of take as read, right? That language changes, that it evolves incredibly quickly. And it is always dependent on its context, not even just its time, but the place in which it's been expressed. These things all, all change. Yeah, and I think a that, that's a, an incredibly difficult thing for computational methodologies to deal with because I mean a lot of them are trained on Twitter aren't they or on modern corpuses Wikipedia you know, yeah which, which is I mean and again it, it makes sense yeah I, I, I would want all sorts of, of sort of so, so it's interesting I, I was there was a project um that some computer scientists were working on a couple of years ago and they brought me in towards the end to try and help interpret their data and they were trying to sort of measure not happiness but a whole range of other human values, whether it was like whether you were more open or closed, whether you were conservative or liberal. And, and it was really interesting. And, and it, they produced these amazing graphs that showed moments through, from 19th century newspapers where society seemed to shift politically, you know, not necessarily in, in its party politics, but in its sort of broader social and cultural politics. And it was really interesting. But I couldn't get at the original data to try and figure out why. All they had was the graph at the end. So there was no way to say, oh, all right, let, let's go in and look, or at least the way they were doing it. There was no way to then show me, OK, what do you mean by openness in 1880? Show me a thousand articles that you think signify liberalism or a liberal attitude in 1840. And they just it hadn't occurred to them, I think, that or at least maybe that they didn't see this as being particularly significant, that you need to sort of verify those results. You know, for them, the theory was sound. You know, it was based on solid kind of um, sociological research of how you measure these values they've right. got the data they got the words they produced the graph and my god like that i wrote I ended up writing basically like a, this hasn't been published yet i don't even know whether this research is going to get published but i basically wrote like a four thousand word thing saying we don't really know what any of this means which is not what they wanted in a scientific paper right so they wanted me to write the, the discussion bit in the middle after they'd set up the methodology and i think what they wanted me to do was to say this proves that in the 1880s you know whatever it is this particular change happened and it's because of you know this particular political reason and you know and I, I was never confident in doing that so I framed it as all right this graph has, allows us to ask all these really interesting questions that we now need to figure out 
And for me, that was great. Like how useful to be prompted to think, to see patterns that I didn't see there before. Patterns that didn't make sense. They didn't fit the established narrative. They exist, right? You know, that data is there. It's been interpreted. Those patterns have produced something. It is measuring something. But I, we have no idea what. And that's why, you know, you want, I would want to come back down from that big picture to the small picture. And for that distant reading to inspire and inform close reading for the theory to, in, to basically pose questions that I will then answer in a more conventional way, I guess. So that's, it's, it's a reciprocal thing for me, right? Like I, I, I don't want the theory on its own. I'm happy to use it if it allows me to ask new questions or to frame more robust arguments. And I think, I don't know if you're, you're doing it intentionally, but you're, you're coming directly to what Burns sort of suggests about the, the value of theory. And he's, he's talking about international relations theory, but theory in general to the historian. And it's this idea that theory acts as sort of a, a check or a resource for thinking about what else might have happened. What are the other hypotheticals that I maybe didn't consider? And I wanted to know is, how often in your work do you not get the expected answer? Is it something that is, is, is do you constantly find yourself surprised or is the exception um, something unique that you sort of go after because it's something that's interesting to you or are human beings constantly surprising you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in all honesty, I, I do tend to try and pursue things that I find surprising, but I think you know, the difference is that you know, when Burns is talking about this model, he's sort of talking about surprising, at least as I understand it, in, in comparison to a really sort of robust predictive methodology of saying, this is what we expect to happen. For me, it's more just surprising in that I think, oh, I didn't think that, or I didn't see that before, or I didn't know the Victorians did that. You know, so there's a, there's a lot of that in my work that I, I find surprising. Um, I've never actually, I mean, I, th I, th I find this really interesting in his article, this idea that you, you sort of construct an established model. This is what I expect to happen. And therefore now let's compare what has happened to that and judge whether it is surprising or not. I think probably like we all probably instinctively do that, right? Where we go into research with expectations of a period, having, you know, read about it for years or decades. And occasionally, yeah, we find things that's, that are unusual, but it's not necessarily based on any kind of, at least in my case, not only based on any kind of rigorous predictive sort of process in the way that Burns is talking about. It's curious, though, I'm kind of like interested to see how I could apply that now. I'm not necessarily sure yet how I would do it, but I think it's an, in it's an interesting idea to look at the way people acted and say, was this the way we might predict they would act based on this situation? But yeah, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting use of theory. I don't think it's the only use of theory, but I think it's a kind of potentially useful one. I remember when I was first learning about the the sort of military history of the American Revolutionary War. So when I was taught the revolution in school, it was taught from a very intellectual, political point of view. We didn't spend much time on the military except for there were battles. Sometimes we won, sometimes we lost. And when I actually got into the, the finer details of some of these battles, I was constantly struck by this because I'm, I'm far from a military tactician, but I have a general sense of good and bad practice in military procedures. Sort of, um, if you have a good hiding place from which you can shoot somebody, um, it's probably best to stay there as opposed to jump out into the open where you can yourself be shot. And when I was learning about 18th century battles, people were constantly doing things that I thought were very counterintuitive. They were marching in these big formations out in the open. Um, they weren't targeting officers. It was, you know, um, you, you just never tried to shoot the general. You would try to shoot just the, the private soldiers. Whereas to me, taking out the leadership seemed like a, a sensible thing to do or yeah. not necessarily a moral thing to do. But, you know, if you just wanted to win the battle and I really I had to be taken aside by my professor at the time and say, you're looking at this from a 21st century mindset. And in the 18th century, it would have been unthinkable to shoot the officers for all of these reasons. And it would have been unthinkable to hide in the bushes and shoot somebody without their knowledge. So that was always explained to me as sort of a, a von Ronke idea that every time and every place has its own rules. Mm. Um, and I think that was useful that the past is a different country. Yeah. But 
it really makes theory very difficult. It makes the idea that um, there's a, a truism in sort of public discourse that history repeats itself. And there's sort of an equal truism in academia that history never repeats itself. <laughs> and I, I sort of would like to to hear your thoughts on that. Is is theory difficult in history because of that uncertainty about repetition or that uncomfort discomfort with repetition? Yeah, I th yeah, I think that absolutely hits the nail on the head, doesn't it? I mean, if in in science you can kind of recreate experiments in, in identical conditions. And in human behavior, I mean, even, you know, outside of history within sort of sociology or psychology now, I think it's, it's very, very difficult to ever recreate the precise conditions in which a theory might be retested. And and so I think for me that that, that immediately means that it's like we were talking about earlier, it, it's impossible to use theories as definitive concrete proof of anything, I think. You know, that's why I think you know, they're more useful for spotting potential patterns. I mean, the does history repeat itself question is interesting in that I, I, you know, one of the things I, I, I'm always trying to do, but often unsuccessfully, is trying to get like my work into newspapers and magazines. And what they really, really want is things like saying this thing that's happening now is like a thing that happened in the past. You know, they, for them, in order for history to be relevant, they want something that has a contemporary hook. So I'm constantly looking for those, those. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say it's repetitions. It's sort of echoes, isn't it? You know, little sort of similar things that played out in the past. And that we might look at now to help give perspective on the present. So in, in that sense, I, you know, I, I do that quite a lot. So I'm, I'm currently doing something on, um, you know, there's been like recent debates about, particularly in, in the wake of, of Black Lives Matter, about what we should do with with sitcoms from the 1970s. You know, like, oh, what yes. should we do with old <laughs> jokes, right? You know, what, um, which are now offensive. Um, and there's some really interesting debates about how do, do we censor them? Do we put a warning and all that kind of stuff? So I'm currently writing an article for a history magazine about how the Victorians did that to 18th century humour, you know, how they kind of censored and, and um, approached that kind of bawdy, sexual bodily humour of the 18th century and kind of rounded off its edges. So I've been looking at how they edited a joke book from the 18th century and basically republished it in the 19th century, but took out 50 odd jokes that they considered bad, you know, that they censored. So for me, I was thinking, OK, right, that's interesting. There is there is something repeating here. We have a sort of generational shift in taste or in cultural values that is playing out in all number of different ways, just like it did, you know, does now and did in the 18th, 19th century. And humor is one of the spaces where people think about that. So in that sense, looking for those echoes, thinking about how, you know, if we're sort of theorizing the way that humor works now, how that might apply to a previous era, I think it's useful. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical of those, of anybody who says that there is this kind of, you know, there, there are those theories, aren't there, that, that history is sort of moving in this sort of incredibly predictable pattern of these kind of waves and cycles and generations and that, you know, that in X number of years we'll have a war or something like that. And that it's it's possible to predict this centuries before because of all these these cyclical forces, you know, like these, these sort of rhythms. And it may be possible to see those kind of things. It feels to me a bit like staring into tea leaves and seeing patterns, you know, like I, I'm, I'm not convinced by it um, as a as a robust thing. So I think, yeah, look, look there, there are things do repeat in, in some respects, but never perfectly. Yeah, the, the idea about the jokes from the, the 1970s and things like that is, is really fascinating because I've been thinking about this a lot as well um, in terms of, of Black Lives Matter um, with the statues mm -hmm. and this idea that we're um, no longer considering certain individuals to be worthy or appropriate to have monuments to, but just the idea of whether or not monuments are something that is, you know, are monuments meant to be long lasting, which seems a really mm. weird grammatical <laughs> sentence for me. Um, but this is something that, again, in the 1970s, we were having very, very similar debates about who should be memorialized and, and how they should be memorialized and things like that. So for me, yeah, the, the questions seem to repeat mm. more than the, the answers. So it, it's not that we always act the same way, but that we are constantly faced with similar situations and in in that respect as critical as i am and as as concerned as i am about turning history into literature because i don't think they're the same thing mm -hmm. i think in terms of learning from the past that might be the the best way of of dealing with it it's i'm never going to be in the exact same situation as um dramaticus or as you know thomas carlyle or napoleon was 
but I may face similar questions and I can sort of take advice from how they decided to approach it and kind of being able to see how it turned out for them that they answered those types of questions in those sorts of ways. So that's how I've always approached history of repeating itself is the fact that that's the universal part is we keep asking the same questions and the specific part is how we choose to answer them. Yeah. I agree. I think there's also there's like it also kind of works in the other direction as well, doesn't it? That we can sort of look at how we're dealing with the problem and then think about how that might inform our understanding of how people in the past right. dealt with the same problem. And again, you know, you've got to be careful about this stuff. Again, they're not in the same circumstances as we are. So it, it, the translation issue is goes both ways. But I do I do find that useful. I find that, you know, if history is always a dialogue between the past and the present, between you know the world in which the historian lives and the past they're exploring, as we face new problems i think yeah it, it does shed new light on or it does allow us gives us perspective and allows us to think about i bet you know that people will be able to write some really interesting um new research on the history of historical pandemics having lived through them right you know i bet that you know it does give you and it's the same reason why we need more black historians because you know their perspective helps to inform black history right you know that you know that they their lived experience is different to the lived experience of a white historian and will, or one would assume at least, produce different kinds of perspectives on the past. You know, I think that's a, that's a really useful thing. And so, yeah, I do find myself sort of, yeah, almost sort of translating backwards, thinking, yeah, okay, I'm living through this thing now. How might that shape? How, does that change the way I, I think about the way people might have experienced this in the past? And the media is interesting, right? So the, the media one would be, look at the way that... Um, the internet has completely destabilized the the industry of journalism mm -hmm. but like you know we could think about the same kind of thing happening in the 19th century and how technologies there completely changed the face of what a newspaper was put loads of people out of the job created new jobs totally transformed what reading public reading was there are interesting parallels there and i think you see i think it's sort of it, it it's it's kind of like theory isn't it you can sort of take a thing that we see happening now and the explanations for it and test them and say okay does this make sense in the 1880s? You know, sometimes not, right? But it's a kind of interesting, it's that tool to think with again, right? You know, that, that's, that's the sort of thing I, I was just going to say. Yeah, it's this, and I think you, you've, you've given me a really interesting perspective on it, I think, that I, I maybe didn't have at the, the beginning of this conversation is that the, I, I often feel the urge to make history, it's going to sound very self deprecating as a historian, to make history more relevant, to make history more. Um, robust or or seem more valuable to to society and theory seems like a way of doing that like if you could predict something then people would would value history more and I think I think translating it backwards actually for me is is very interesting this idea that we can take our theories and our experiences and ask different questions as opposed to take our data and give different answers and, and being able to go backwards is a unique privilege of being a historian i think i don't think most other disciplines get the privilege of of taking all the conclusions and the theories and then trying to break them apart with the data in the same way so that's that's fascinating actually yeah i mean again i you i feel like i'm just sort of got to say and, and and here are all the caveats for this kind of stuff but like, but just just yeah for the avoidance of doubt i mean i would still say in all this stuff i'm still i'm still looking for evidence ultimately right that's that's all of this stuff is just interesting ways to think about things interesting ways to ask questions like you said to get perspectives but ultimately when i'm going to publish something or when i'm going to make a claim i'm still looking for that thing i can cite or that thing where i can say okay here is how i know this not here is how i think this might be true Oh, here is how I think this is likely. You know, that's something, as long as I've got some kind of robust evidence for that, I'm all right. I wouldn't want just to apply the way we think about things now and say, that's probably what people thought in the 1880s. I've been looking for some evidence for that. And that's such an important idea. And this is something that I've, I've noticed quite a lot in modern media, um, is that there, there used to be this concern or this caveat where people would say, um, this, is, this has happened, this is true. And they would say, oh, yes, but that's just anecdotal evidence. That's just one example of it. But it seems to me that we've gone past anecdotal evidence now and, and moved solely into theoretical evidence that, you know, this is how people think or this is how people would react to this. And people aren't even providing the anecdotal evidence anymore. And I find that really concerning. And yeah. um, 
that that is something that historians are particularly good at, I think, is shoveling on the data and, and the evidence. And I guess that brings me to my last question, which is whether you're you're using theory to help fill in gaps or you're trying to better understand general principles of humanity or even just of a, a particular situation. You said you're, you're always looking for the evidence. You're always looking for something you can hang your hat on. Could you kind of talk me through your process of that then? Like, what do you, how do you decide what is the most important cause of something or the most likely precipitating factor? How do you sort of weigh things mm -hmm. when there are, there are technically thousands of causes, but you can only talk about two or three in an article? Yeah. I have to think about this because uh, it was interesting reading Burns's piece, you know, again, thinking about this, where there seems within that to be this sort of desire to sort of to almost again almost quantifiably or at least very clearly say this is the main cause of something and i've been sort of thinking i, I don't think i often do that in my work i don't think you know i it, it feels a bit like people making like ultimate sort of lists of the top 10 songs of a band and saying this is this is number one this is number two as if this is like it i would say it doesn't really matter i'm not i'm really not that bothered about what was about deciding which was the main cause of something. I'm interested in figuring out what are the possible reasons something might have happened and sort of exploring and considering those things. I, I think I would very rarely say this thing happened mainly for this reason and slightly less for this reason. I would, that's probably not the kind of history I do. Though having said that, I think there are obviously plenty of people who do that, who will be sort of trying to say this is the main cause of this conflict or this is the main reason this person, you know, um, gave this political speech or something like that. Um, I think in general, that's just not the kind of stuff I do, um, which is odd to say like a historian is not interested in why things happen. Um, but I am, but I'm just not necessarily interested in obsessively weighing those things up and trying to decide which which are the most important. I would accept that in terms of your, you know, your top three reasons why something happened. But I would press you on this a little bit more because there are surely hundreds of reasons that occur to you, flip through your mind, that you have a tiny bit of evidence for, that you dismiss, that never make it into the article in the first place. So you are technically saying that these are the more likely ones because they're the ones I actually yeah. talk about. So Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think what this is revealing is that I don't have a robust process for making these decisions. Um, so, no, I mean, I think my research process generally is read an enormous number of Victorian newspapers until I have a sort of intuitive sense of something and then try and corral that evidence into a kind of series of explanations that I think are representative of of the thing I'm interested in. So I think generally speaking I would be looking for as much corroborating evidence of something as I can. So it, and this, this is a thing we see a lot now and since we got newspapers digitized is people will pick out that one source that sort of um, says something when it's not at all representative because they've keyword searched it and they found it. And so I'm very cautious of not trying to do that. You know, I, I, I want to have enough evidence so that I can say with a reasonable amount of confidence that the three or four, five or six sources I cite are representative of a much wider phenomenon within the context of what I'm looking at. You know, it might be whether I'm looking at, it, you know, Anglo-American relations, then I'm talking about really big processes. I might just be talking about something much smaller, in which case, you know, it's a smaller body. But yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I honestly don't think I have, to come to think of it, a really clear sort of checklist or methodology where I say, this is this is my, this is the way I do things. It's It's a much more, I don't know, casual way of doing things where I'm just assembling evidence, considering it, looking at it, trying to make sense of it myself, and then seeing what makes a convincing argument. And there's no, it's not, yeah, it, it, it's not a very scientific process in that sense. I mean, I, I certainly found it difficult. I must have read that paragraph in Burns about 15 times where he said, assuming you have no evidence, what percentage probability would you put on this happening or that? <laughs> yeah, and then assuming yeah. you had this much evidence, how much would you do now? And then divide this by that. Like it was a very, yeah, very I, I quantitative struggled with that. method. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I understood the concept of what he was trying to tried to explain. I actually did get a piece of scratch paper and try to yeah, work yeah. out some simple problem. And I agree with you that I, I, I probably do something like that implicitly, subconsciously, as I'm reading. So I say, oh, that reminds me of this, this reminds me of that, and it kind of builds and builds and snowballs until it's an idea. And 
I said at the beginning of this that you were a, a trailblazer in DH pedagogy, which I absolutely, absolutely believe. But I'm, I'm curious as to how we go about discussing theory and methodology and historical understanding and historical selection with our students. So if we don't have a firm idea, if I can't on the top of my head explain the methodology for weighing evidence, I am nonetheless conveying that to my students um, through acculturation or, or some kind of os osmosis of historical learning. How do you approach it with you, your students? Do you think of methodology or, or historical judgment as a methodology? So having basically waffled and said I have no methodology in my own research, I do try and teach students a more systematic way of doing things. Um, so I, I teach a lot of classes on journalism history or on 19th century social and cultural history that uses digital archives and newspapers as one of their main sources. And, and students usually have one or two problems. Either they put a keyword search in and they get back 100,000 results and then come to me and say, what do I do now? Or they have the opposite problem where they put search terms in that aren't particularly effective and they get nothing and therefore, or they get very few things, and then they struggle to sort of frame an argument. So I, d I do teach sort of various methodological steps for refining searches, for creating samples. Um, and and this is because I think for most of my students, at least, they're, they're exploring these topics for the first time. They don't have an enormous amount of time to do it in. In my own research, I think I can afford to meander and take a lot more time and just kind of wallow in sources and explore them in a much more casual way, partly just because I'm not under the same time pressure that they are writing an essay in two weeks. But when they've got a limited amount of time and they don't have that existing contextual understanding, I do try and teach them things like, OK, how do you take a representative sample of newspapers? You know, whether they're sort of sample depends on their question, right? Whether they're sort of taking a few every year or a few every month, whether they're selecting based on the newspaper's politics. So we kind of go through all of that and what a sample should be. And so I do, I do try and, and encourage them to have that methodology, to be able to write in their essays, okay, I'm, I'm exploring this phenomenon. I'm basing these conclusions on 500 articles that I've found using this particular method of collecting them. Because I think for them, it allows them to make, to avoid some of the pitfalls of, of cherry picking and just pick, reading the first 10 articles and then trying to figure out something from there. But I think in my own work, maybe I should do that more in my own work, but generally speaking, I try and read everything when I do something. I mean, you know, I can't do it for, for every question, but I'm currently, I'm currently writing a, a book chapter on the history of American cocktails in Victorian Britain. I'm trying to figure out like what, basically the question is, what do the Victorians think of American drinks and what kind of cultural work did those drinks perform as a kind of intermediary in transatlantic relations? And because I don't have to write it in two weeks, I can spend a decent amount of time reading thousands of articles mentioning the word mint julep or cocktail or something like that, just to try and figure it. And when I feel like I've got a strong sense of how representative it is, then I start assembling that evidence into the, the stuff that works best in an article but you're right in teaching i think we we have to model that because it's not something that necessarily comes naturally you know then they need they need some sort of step-by-step -step process i think or at least it helps for some of them yes i think the the time pressure point is is a really valid one i think a lot of people when they're teaching they're saying that the students are novices or they're unsure or they're nervous and the methodology helps them but I think the time pressure thing is actually quite, quite important because for most of my research, anything that I'm particularly proud of, we'll say it that way, um, it's been the result of serendipity. I happen to fall upon a certain article in a certain order of having read things and it sparked a connection sometimes with, you know, a documentary I'd seen 10 years previously. Yeah. And it's just a serendipity of all the different things flowing around in my brain. And that's very difficult to manufacture artificially. Yeah. And um, I think that's that's probably the most important thing I would say about theory is that theory can be very useful in abstracting a lot of those general feelings that we have, but it can't replace the random bits of data we picked up 10 years ago that suddenly just make everything makes sense in a certain way so yeah yeah i think i think the idea of the the relationship between data and theory is 
is a lot more bound up together than than we sometimes think. There's there's not a clear division of labor but between yeah. the two things. You're right, you're right. I think that that your method of devising new research absolutely mirrors mine in that my method is generally randomly browse through Victorian newspapers looking for fun stuff to tweet and accidentally find things to write articles about. It's sort of generally how I work. Very rare do I go in with the question. And yet with our students, that's generally what we do, right? We set them a question or, or ask them to invent one from thin air. And then they have to figure out a method for answering that question. And that's very rarely do I work like that. You know, I think generally speaking, I start with the evidence and figure out how to explain it. Whereas they've been asked to start with a question and figure and find the evidence for it. And that does, yeah, you're right. That serendipity ain't going to do that. Not in the time they got. No, so absolutely not. I think it's it's essential. I think if if and I, and yeah, and actually, if I was, if somebody said to me, you know, you need to write an article in two weeks, and here's the question we want you to to answer, I think I would probably try and go in with a a more robust methodology, a more clear sense of what I'm going to search, how what how much I'm going to look at. So otherwise, yeah, that's that's sort of wandering in the dark, isn't it? And here's the philosophical question we'll leave it with. If you were given a question, something that was socially relevant, socially important, and you had two weeks to write your essay on it, do you think it would produce better work? Um, <laughs> that's interesting. I think I would produce work that I wouldn't have produced otherwise. I think it would probably force me to think about things I hadn't thought about. It would probably put me out of my comfort zone. So actually, so reading Burns's article is, is the kind of thing I would never normally have read. And it sort of forced me to think about things I haven't thought about before or thought about for a long time. I think that's really useful. I think that's good for us. So in a sense, I, um, being able to choose our own research is a really nice privilege. But it is also a comfort zone, isn't it? It's um, I do find myself maybe not necessarily taking on those kind of challenges as much as I would, or as much as I did as a student. So I think it's a really powerful thing. I think I would produce... So actually, an example of it is, is that cosmopolitan network, right? I, that's forced me to try and think of something that I never would have thought about before or frame it in terms I haven't, I haven't thought about before. I found that really useful. And again, it's that tool for thinking, isn't it? it it's that, that situation of forcing us to answer a question is a really useful way of opening new doors or getting our mind to use different sort of mental muscles, I suppose. I like that. I find that quite exciting. But at the same time, like somebody's got to force me to do it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just keep writing about Victorian jokes. Well, I think we'll end it there because that was a fantastic place to end it. Um, yeah, thank I, I thank you so much, Bob, for, for coming oh, on and, and taking part. And I hope that, um, like you say, that this helps both of us think about things in a, a slightly weird way and, and helps us be better historians going forward. Yeah, I, I hope so. I think it's made me realise I need to actually sort of understand what I do a little bit better. <laughs> that's been, yeah, that's healthy, I reckon. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Bob.